Um, please, Georgia, can you just tell me? It's visible. It's visible? Yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I will give a presentation which is mainly related with the near infrared hyperspectral imaging applied to the identification and spatial location of collagen in archaeological bones. My name is uh, Rocco Mazzeo, and I am working at the University of Bologna in the chemistry department, um, heading the microchemistry and microscopy art diagnostic laboratory, which is based in Ravenna, which is a, a branch of the main central university, which is based in, uh, in Bologna. So it is a campus. Uh, if you don't mind, I would like to uh, start this presentation by saying something about the team, because this um, uh, this doctoral summer school couldn't happen without the help of the of my, without the help of my team, and so uh, I I am sure, and I think that they deserve some words from my side to acknowledge their help. The microchemistry, the microchemistry, the M2, M2 ADL laboratory is made by person. Uh, and this is a, a, a key factor because our person that makes things happening. Uh, this person are Silvia Prati, who is an associate professor, Giorgia Schutto, who is an assistant professor, and Emilio Catelli, who is a postdoctoral researcher. Uh, all, they all, uh, together with Gianluca Chiapponi, which is a laboratory technician, have been really very important in the organization of the, of the doctoral summer school. And here you can see also the four PhD students that we are now that we have now in our laboratory. Uh, they are all participating, by the way, to this in this uh, doctoral summer school. Lucrezia Gatti, Marco Chavez, Francesca Ramazzotti, and Zelan Lee. You see also their 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 link, so that if you want to exchange some information with them, of course you can you can do it. The microchemistry and microscopy, our laboratory, is very much instrumental, not only into the research activity that I will briefly explain to you before the real starting of the presentation, but is also instrumental to the implementation and development of this uh, second uh, cycle degree or two-year master degree in science for the conservation and restoration of cultural heritage that I established at the University of Bologna in the year 2009. So it is already uh, some year that it is uh, uh, active. And, and now this, um, this, uh, this master degree is, um, is coordinated by Silvia, by Silvia Prati. Um, this master degree, as you can see, is uh, about science for the conservation and restoration of cultural heritage, and it is really very much interdisciplinary. We are not uh, teaching only the use of chemistry, physics, mineralogy, and biology applied to the field of cultural heritage, but also uh, courses on more from the humanistic world, such, such as uh, management, the uh, history of art, and other courses that makes the real work of a conservation scientist more uh, embedded into a wide, into the wider context of cultural, of cultural heritage. What uh, our laboratory does for cultural heritage, you see here, we have some. I highlighted some of the activities that we that we that we do such as the development of advanced analytical methods for the scientific examination of works of art, the development of new chemometric strategies for the evaluation of spectral data. These two especially will be 
um, better explain exactly into the issue uh, that I will be presenting you uh, later on, but also the development and testing of new restoration materials and methods, the study of causes and degradation process, and also some research on technical art history or archaeology. Here, just a few examples on the development of these advanced analytical techniques. Here you can see a preparation method that we have been developing very recently that, is, that was developed especially for the analysis of dyes mixture. So the mixture are extracted from the textile or from the, from the art, uh, art object, and then they are put as a mixture on a glass which is covered by gold and then also by a silver iodide uh, layer which is used to enhance the the uh, the identification and the spectral profile of the of the of the of the dice then this mixture is put into into a container where the different dice are eluted and then uh, on the eluted part as you can see by using uh, Raman spectroscopy or infrared spectroscopy, we can directly uh, get the infrared or Raman spectrum of the of the of the dye which was uh, contained into the into the into the mixture. You can see here the three eluted the three eluted um, dyes that were included into the mixture, and here a magnification. And here are the spectral, um, the spectra of the different dyes that that now are much more easily recognized. What is in what is important to underline in this technique, it is that it is very sensitive. Um, without this addition process, it wouldn't be possible with by both by Raman and by infrared spectroscopy to make uh, to understand the composition of a mixture like that. But we also use, uh, we are very well advanced in immunochemical imaging methods. Here you can see a cross-section taken from a painting just to show you that it's possible at the same time directly onto the cross-section to make not only the characterization of the presence of collagen, such as the one which is used generally in, uh, in the preparation of, of paintings, so for example in Glue tempera of, of albumin, which is used in egg tempera or casein. And you can see here the results that we achieve, um, highlighting the presence of collagen in the preparation in the preparation layer, but also the presence of, of albumin in the upper layer, which corresponds to a fixative made of, of albumin and applied on the painting. This fixative has only a couple of micron thickness, and um, the, it, 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 it is quite uh, quite difficult, of course, for any other technique to highlight the presence of such a very thin layer of of uh, proteinaceous materials present on the outermost layer of a paint of a paint layer. But we also, as I told you, we develop and test new. Um, new uh, new cleaning system because the problem is that all the cleaning that system that have been that are currently and have been extensively used in the past are made with solvents that sometimes are not only dangerous for the paint layer because uh, some of them can be absorbed by the paint layer and so not only be active on the material that we want to remove but they sometimes they remain and are trapped within the paint layer, highlighting the possibility also for the paint layer to be in some way dissolved or swelled or swelled or or sometimes um, uh, creating creating problems. So we try to develop a, a green uh, a system which is made by gel, which is non -to non -to non toxic both for the environment. Both, uh, uh, and to conserve the restore and of course uh, to the and of course to the uh, to the art object uh, we are using biopolymers so which comes from 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 nature 
and by using also green solvents, which are, as I told you, biodegradable. And uh, the application is very, is quite simple. The first we put a Japanese paper, and then the gel, uh, and then another Japanese paper on top. We wait for some minutes. It depends from the type of materials that we want to remove. And then, and, and then the gel is removed and the remnant of the gel eventually left on the surface are removed in a dry condition. So without using, of course, any, any other gel. But also we studied uh, causes of degradation process, such as, for example, in this uh, important and very famous uh, Chimabue um, uh, uh, panel, uh, panel paintings of a Madonna enthroned with child and two angels. If you see here in the in a, a, a close up of the throne, we see these decorations which are now brown or quite uh, black. And we realized that this brown black is were, was made by arsenicum and silver. They contain both arsenicum and silver. They were supposed to, to, uh, to, um, to be a gilding technique. So a fake, a kind of fake gilding, but actually this, uh, this color that was originally yellow because, um, because they were using ore pigment mixed with silver, now has become uh, dark uh, brown uh, black. And this is because the contemporary presence of silver together with, uh, with ore pigment in presence of moisture and lights produce silver sulfides and arsenicum oxide, of oxide that are responsible for the darkening of the, um, of the layer. But also we use, as I told you, technical art history. This is a study, an extensive study that, or work that was already published in, uh, some years ago in, in 2011 and was concerning the study of uh, 28 portraits of the so-called famous men, which are exhibited in the Ducat Palace of Urbino. Uh, 14 of them are at the Louvre and 14 are in the Ducal Palace. And the question was whether they were painted by a Flemish painter known um, to have lived in Urbino under the court of Federico da Montefeltro. And of course, we started with the normal uh, normal methodology that we are using. So the combination of non-invasive and micro-invasive technique by using multispectral imaging with whom we can, uh, with which we can give, a, have, have an idea of the, <coughs> of the, of the drawings, of the under drawings. We can have, we can use also uh, false color infrared to have an idea of the pigments that were used and then also UV fluorescence in order to understand which are the re mainly which are the repainted part. But other than these, <laughs> the, all these non-invasive techniques allow us to better understand from where eventually take the sample in order to understand whether, stratigraphically speaking, and materiality and from the material point of view speaking, there were some feature that were typical of the Flemish painting, uh, painting and well, that were not present at that time in the Italian in the Italian painting technique. And this was the case of this uh, uh, very very thin uh, priming layer that was applied on top of the preparatory layer. This priming layer is typical of the Flemish <coughs> of the Flemish painting and is constituted by secative oil carbon black particles, calcium carbonate, and lead white, which is absolutely different from the typical priming layer that probably you all know was used in the 14th century, 14th century in Italy. In order to characterize this very thin layer, of course, we had to use also some synchroton-based radiation, <coughs> such as the synchroton, uh, synchroton uh, micro XRF uh, where we were able to do this uh, uh, map, elemental mapping that allowed us to also understand uh, the, co the chemical composition of the, of, of the layer. So we realized uh, with this technique that some of, the, of those paintings were really done uh, by using a, a, a Flemish uh, painting uh, 
Flemish painting technique. Of course, we cannot say uh, who, is, who was the master, but the master was supposed to be Justo de Gand, Just de Gand. And so at least we know that Just de Gand, which was supposed to live in Urbino during the, to stay in Urbino at the, at the court of Federico da Montefeltro, perhaps was absolutely participating into the production of these into, into the production of these paintings. So let's go now that you know something more about the activity that we do in our, uh, in our laboratory. Let's speak a little bit more about near, near infrared spectroscopy applied to the field of cultural heritage. As you probably already know, it is a non-invasive analytical technique. Uh, it comes with portable instrumentation for on-site investigation there is no need for pretreatment or sampling. Uh, it is quite fast in terms of data acquisition, and it can be performed both on single points, so single areas, or by using hyperspectral imaging analysis to the entire to the entire object. The spectral range that are that are uh, considered with this technique are mainly two, two spectral range. One is the near infrared range, which goes from 700 to 1,000, 1,100 nanometers. And then also the short wave infrared, which goes under the acronym of SWIR, which goes from, the, from 1,100 to 2,500. The near uh, the um, near infrared spectroscopy it is not new. Uh, it is a technique which is well known. It was first applied already and published in 1992 by a colleague of ours, uh, Dr. Bacci, uh, from from Flores. Applied, as you can see, for the understanding of the painting uh, technique by using uh, fiber optics reflectance spectroscopy in the range, in the wider range that goes from even in, the, in this case from visible to near to near infrared. So it is not new. Uh, some some specification about the, the chemistry of the of, of the near infrared. Uh, we have to say that uh, near infrared is we can consider it as a qualitative analysis. It cannot be quantitative analysis, uh, but it is uh, it is important because a chemical compound can be recognized by overtone and combination combination bands, which are quite characteristics of uh, some specific materials, as I will show you in the in the in afterwards. So there is a difference, of course, between SWIR and MIR. Um, in, in, by MIR stands for medium infrared, OK? In the SWIR, we have bands which are broad and poorly resolved combination and, overtake, and, and overtone modes. They are less specific, of course, than mid infrared spectroscopy, which is the most, as you probably know, the most used, historically used spectral range of the infrared, of the infrared region that has been used for the specific purpose of studying uh, historic and archaeological materials. Whereas in the medium infrared region, we have the formation of bands that are induced when the uh, the, the methodology used is the total reflection, and, of, and also in the mere, in the medium infrared region, we have also some overlapping of diagnostic of diagnostic band. How the how the data are acquired, uh, the 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 technique uh, foresee the use of the measurement of a dark uh, current. Here you can see the head of the instrument. And then you need to uh, to make some uh, to collect 
the uh, raw reference measurement of a standard sample um, with known reflectance values, and then you can go directly on your object and perform and collect without touching the object in a non-invasive way the, uh, the spectrum, the near infrared spectrum. What you obtain are spectra like this, which are, as I told you, very broad, not that much, not that much specific. <laughs> but at the very first, we can start with some data processing, which is very simple, which is already included into any software available in in, in any in any um, uh, near infrared. Uh, machine, uh, such as, for example, apply the first derivative. The first derivative, as you can see, changes a lot the shape uh, in order to understand the right value of a single band. You have to look at this value, which is exactly in the middle of this slope, which corresponds to the exact uh, value of the of, of the peak. So, so this value is now, when looked at the first derivative, exactly here, in, in the middle. And this is actually, as you, as you can see here, this is a publication of the, in, uh, published in Analytical Methods in 2017. Uh, this technique was applied on a, a Jackson Pollock uh, paintings. As you can see here, this is the normal reflectance spectra where you see this poorly resolved band that you can better see when these spectra are converted and uh, pre-processed with by using the first derivative as you can see here this peak for example is exactly located here in the middle of this of the in the middle of this slope so once you have uh, once you have this possibility to pre-process data by using by using the first derivative this is a way to understand the spectrum band by band what we call a univariate uh, understanding of the spectrum what we can do now is uh, try to try to make things a little bit more more comprehensive by using a so-called multivariate analysis. In this case, we will not only try to interpret the single band that you have in a spectrum, in an unknown spectrum, but we will consider the old spectrum, from, uh, which comprises all peaks within the range of the sphere of the near infrared, infrared range. By using, for example, the hyperspectral imaging, you have reflectance image spectroscopy in the sphere range. In this case, you do not collect only one single spectrum, but you collect, of course, a, sing a higher number of spectra that can be collected. And these are more representative results, especially when you are dealing with heterogeneous system, with heterogeneous surfaces. <laughs> and we can, you can collect information on the distribution of components or information on the state on the state of conservation of a given of a given object now we uh, we try to apply this technique also to the investigation of bones but for example you will have after me you will have a two lecture that will better explain more about why ancient bones are important, but I want just to spend, if you allow me, just a couple of minutes to say that bones are complex biomineralized tissue that are composed by bone by both a mineral and organic fraction. The mineral fraction is mainly uh, composed by hydroxyapatite, whereas the organic fraction is mainly composed of collagen type 1. And this study are very, very much important, both into, paleo, into paleoproteonomic and uh, C14 dating, uh, C14 dating technique, because it is important with this technique to better understand the period, the diet, and the environment 
where human being or fauna have have lived. There is also a, a, there, there are of course problems uh, in the analysis of ancient bones, and this is due to the fact that we have the diagnostic process during burial during burial, and we have of course uh, biological and chemical degradation. For example, the mineral fraction may be affected by the penetration of ground waters into the bone structure. Hydrolysis can also take place, inducing the breakage of the bake of the peptide bond of the collagen, leading to the decomposition of the protein aceous material. So at the end, we have an heterogeneous distribution of the remaining collagen. And of course, the technique is that are actually used, the paleoproteomic and the C14 are very much, uh, are very good to understand uh, all this, all, all this, um, all the, the, the composition, especially of the, of the, of the collagen, but they are really very complex as you will, as you will see afterwards and are carried out in very specialized laboratory. They are also exp ex expensive, and of course, they need collagen. They need to be sure <laughs> that the bones still contain uh, some collagen, okay? And which is something that is not always said, not, not always true, because of this diagenesis, diagnostic process that bones have undergone while during. So our purpose was to try to develop a technique that could be useful, uh, useful as a pre-screening analysis. And we wanted our technique to be non-invasive, fast, extensive means that could have a, a, a clear uh, idea, uh, all the, um, uh, including all the, all the, all the objects, not only part of it, sensitive and of course, specific for the collagen because we wanted to know whether into a piece of bone which where the area where collagen was most present so that in this way uh, paleoanthropologists can better identify the, uh, identify the area from where eventually collect the sample for the paleoproteinomic or c14 C14 dating. dating. There are, of course, other techniques that can be used, such as the micro Raman, micro FTIR, but also, for example, we can use the near infrared uh, technique uh, by single point analysis. But, of course, they are time consuming, they are micro destructive, sometimes uh, superficial, and, of course, they require you to do a lot of points because they are single point analysis instead of being a extensive uh, uh, analysis uh, technique. So we moved into the hyperspectral imaging, which is, as I told you, fast. You can have in a very, in a very, uh, in a very uh, quick time, <coughs> the chemical, you can get in a very quick time, the chemical image of the of the object, no, it is non-invasive because you don't need to. It is it, you don't need to collect uh, to collect any sample. It is green because it doesn't require any any reagent. No, um, in chemistry, green means also that you don't need any reagent, for example, to make to extract it. And extensive because, as I told you you can have in one single shot the presence of collagen in all the surface of the bone. This work is, of course, not only carried out by our laboratory. We are part of a team that is working since already uh, some years on this, on, on this issue, and particularly the Bologna Radiocarbon Laboratory devoted to human evolution which is a laboratory established within the department where I am, uh, where I'm working, the laboratory of osteoarchaeology and paleoanthropology, the so-called bone labs, which belongs to the Department of Cultural Heritage 
also at the University of Bologna, and the Department of Pharmacy and Analytical Chemistry of the University of Gen Genoa, which is the laboratory which deals with the image acquisition and data uh, uh, processing. Our laboratory is dealing, of course, at the same time with conceptualization and data processing, as I will, as I will show you. This is the, the analytical the instrument that we are using, and I want just to highlight it is from this from specimen <coughs> spectral imaging. Uh, just to, I want to highlight some important feature, uh, the spectrum range, which is, um, which is uh, considered goes from 1000 to 2500 uh, five, um, nanometers. And the, it is actually an horizontal li uh, line scanner. So it moves, it works actually in this, in this way. It is really a, a scanner. So uh, how to how we started to proceed with this technique that was, as I told you, aimed at evaluating and have a rough but quite precise idea of the quantity of collagen still present in ancient in ancient bones. We start with some reference sample bone sample that <laughs> where the content of collagen was established with other uh, analytical technique okay and so we have here you see one two three four five uh, three six sample with dip with a different amount of uh, of collagen that was as i told you <coughs> uh, evaluated with uh, chemical with chemical analysis um, they belong more or less from the same from the same uh, century and this is the unknown sample, where, of course, as you can see, the collagen percentage is not, is not, is not known. The first one, RB, belongs to uh, uh, approximate age is 45,000 years. Um, 45,000 years. The, the second one comes from the second and the third from from a human body, uh, the fourth and third century, uh, century before before Christ, um, and uh, you see this is a typical uh, a typical infrared spectrum in the into the near range that we can get uh, from the places where uh, from the places where collagen in, is present, and why I am showing this spectrum because uh, I wanted just to show you which are the bands which are characteristic of the which are that are characteristic of the presence of collagen and we are speaking mainly of the 2060 nanometer which is the stretching of the of the nitrogen hydrogen combination band the 2195 which is the bending and second overtone bending of the NH at the second overtone of the carbon uh, double bond stretching combination, and the 2293, which is the uh, carbon hydrogen stretching and bending combination band, typical of collagen. Of course, because the spectrum is collected from, uh, from, a, from, a, from a bone, we have also to consider the 1958-59, uh, which is the OH banding, uh, the second overtone of the OH stretching combination band, presence into the present into the hydroxy apatite, which is an hydroxy, an hydroxy calcium phosphate, as you, as you know. Now, <laughs> we we can, as I told you, we are not using we are not using a single spectrum to make to map. The presence of the of the um, of the collagen, but we applied a chemometric approach, which is based on the NDI, so the normalized uh, difference image. That, as you can see, is the ratio between the reflectance value at a wavelength characterizing the hydroxyapatite, 
uh, over the, the reflectance values of a wavelength characteristic of the collagen. The NDA values uh, for each pixel are plotted on a scale where red represents the maximum volume of, value of collagen and blue the minimum value. And this gives rise to a so-called false color chemical map uh, which represents the distribution of collagen in our object. So you can see here, these are the standard sample that uh, whose content was already known, the one that we calculated based on chemical imaging, chemical methods. And we can see here that the results achieved are well in, uh, in, uh, in agreement with the chemical uh, results that we, that, we, that we collected. We can see that there are places such as the FBF, <laughs> which contains, for example, 20% of collagen, and you can see the area where collagen is mostly present and area where the collagen is not is not present, is not present at all. You can see here where everything looks blue, which means that we have a very low content of collagen. In fact, this area corresponds to a value of a percentage of collagen of 2.9. This is the, the image or a, of a real now sample. This is a bone. As you can see, this is the, the, the marker. It is about uh, 20, 25 centimeter, centimeter long. In red, uh, uh, yellow, in the, in the, sorry, in blue, green, and red, you can see the different areas which correspond uh, respectively the blue to the low content of collagen, the green with the mid level, and the red correspond to the high level of of the of the of the of the bone and you can see here for example these uh, these are the spe these are, uh, are spectra extracted from the different from the different area which uh, um, which show up the each row of interest means each area with the where these each area with low meat and high content of collagen are distributed. And of course, this is of the almost important for, uh, for those working in this field, because uh, first of all, we know that collagen is still present, and now we can all also select areas where the collagen is mostly present with, at, uh, with, higher, with, higher, uh, with higher content. But of course, <laughs> as, you can, as you have seen here, we have a very heterogeneous distribution. We don't know nothing about the concentration of the of the of the collagen content. So uh, what we what we did, we select uh, a, we did a kind of assessment of the approach. As you can see, we selected different areas of the bones here, uh, an area with a very low content and uh, which correspond exactly to a percentage of 8.77. Uh, Here, this central part, which is uh, highlighted in red, as you can see, with a higher content, and the same uh, happens uh, with, the, with the others. So these are the sampling areas and a related percentage of collagen um, extracted. So, uh, now, in this way, we are able to say to the anthropologist which are the area which can, that contains uh, still uh, higher, uh, good amount of collagen that can be collected and used for both proteomics or uh, for uh, C14, C14 uh, dating. Actually, as far as we know, the minimum percentage which is needed for to perform the above mentioned analysis, the proteomics of C14, is about one, two, three percent. Perhaps I am. Uh, I think that this is the average percentage. So in this case, for example, in all these areas here, uh, whichever is the sampling area, we could have 
enough um, enough uh, collagen uh, uh, for uh, to be uh, to be used for the for the for the analysis. So let's uh, go into the into the conclusion. 